All right. Hello, and uh, thank you for joining us uh, for the Plant Healthcare Equipment and Application Tools webinar. Uh, my name is Peter. I am the brand manager for Rainbow Tree Care Scientific Advancements, and I will be your moderator uh, for today's webinar. Uh, in the room here in Minnesota, uh, I'm joined by Emily Reller, uh, the research and development project manager for Rainbow, and by Jeff Hafner, uh, director of municipal consulting with Rainbow. Uh, before we get started, a couple of quick housekeeping items uh, in order to get your ISA CEU uh, for this webinar. Uh, you'll need to enter in your ISA certification number into the question slash chat box uh, right now, and uh, we'll make sure that you get your CEU for attending. Uh, if you have any questions during the webinar, uh, feel free to also type those into the same box, and uh, we'll try to answer as many of those as we can uh, at the end of the presentation uh, with whatever time we have left available. Uh, now, for those of you who have joined us on our previous webinars, uh, you probably already have heard me talk about uh, this uh, already, uh, but for those of you who are joining us for the first time, uh, I would like to make a quick plug uh, for saluting branches. Uh, it's an important day of service that is hosted all across the country where green industry professionals give back to veteran cemeteries uh, by performing tree and uh, landscape work. Uh, last year, we had over 1,400 people uh, volunteer, uh, and we donated more than $1.4 million in services. Uh, this year, Saluting Branches will be on September 20th, 2017. If you would like more information on how to get involved, uh, please go to salutingbranches.org. Uh, all right, uh, now to start off the webinar on PHC equipment and application tools, uh, I'd like to go ahead and welcome Emily. Thank you, Peter. As Peter said, my name is Emily Reller. I work in research and development here at Rainbow, and I've been working for the past three years a lot with our PHC equipment, as well as developing some of our maintenance and troubleshooting guidelines. So I've developed this training to help kind of give you an introduction to our suite of PHC equipment that we offer at Rainbow and that we've developed, as well as to give you a little bit of background on some of the maintenance and troubleshooting of that equipment if you're already using it. I always like to start off, as many of us do at Rainbow, our, our any talk about PHC with a description of what we call the toolbox approach. So when you're approaching plant health care or PHC as an arborist, you have a variety of tools and techniques available to you ranging from root and enhancement and air tools to cultural practices, tree injection, soil drench and injection, and sprays, and probably the other things that aren't even listed here. And, and within all those categories, there's a variety of tools and application methods and products available to you depending on what your needs are. So, so how do you choose? And the answer is that it really breaks down with what, what is the um, client's preference, what is the site requirements that might be present, whether it's um, restricted soil area or um, a sensitive site with a high water table, what is the pest biology, what does the science um, show is the best treatment option? So there's there's really no one answer for what tool is going to be something like the silver bullet of PHC. We always say that there's a toolbox of options available for you and, and choose the thing that's best for your business, your clients, and, and what you're trying to do as a PHC practice, what problem you're trying to solve. The main... Um, plant healthcare applications that I'm going to talk about are soil applications, and I'm, I'm actually not going to talk about drenching, I'm going to talk about um, soil injection with our um, soil injection probe, the HTI, um, and then sprays, whether that's a, a systemic bark spray or a foliar spray, and tree injection, both macro injection and micro injection. So to begin with soil injection, the tool that Rainbow's developed is called the HTI 2000, or we affectionately refer to it as the HTI. Um, this device can be run off of a motorized backpack sprayer for small jobs or remote trees. It can also be run off of a truck-mounted spray tank. And we recommend that the operating pressure is at about 100 to 130 PSI at the unit. 
The HDI is really easy to operate. It's designed to be to to get around all of the flow meters and some of the more um, artful devices out there with soil injection. This device is meant to be really applicator friendly and easy to use and allow you to be more accurate with your product dosing and usage. So we've got these simple fill and inject buttons on the top of the device here. We've got a calibrated dosing chamber and a counter that keeps track of, of how you're dosing. So essentially uh, many of our product guides are listed in terms of uh, an ejection site per dbh inch so you're going up to your tree you're going to hit this fill button which is going to fill this calibrated uh, chamber to a certain dose that you set as soon as you release that fill button it's going to stop filling and then you hit the inject button and it'll inject that dose you know exactly how much you've injected and that counter says you've injected one injection site this system was developed for use with plant growth regulators, specifically our Campostat Paclobutrazol growth regulator, um, as well as systemic insecticides such as our Zytec product, which is midacolprid, and um, Asaphate, which is our uh, Lepitec product, and our Transtec product, which is Dinotecaron. So this is just a short video to show you, for those of you who've never seen what soil injection with this type of device looks like. You can see the applicator, he's hooked up to a truck-mounted spray tank here. He's got a long hose line, and he's just going around making those injection sites into the tree. He's pushing down to fill, injecting in that site, and he's moving around the tree to do the next site. All of the injections are made about three inches below soil grade, and they're within about a foot of the base of the tree in that fine root system. So it's pretty easy to just make your way around the tree and deliver an even dose all the way around. The actual unit itself is a pretty hefty uh, aluminum body. It's got this, uh, this outer casing here where you see the display on top. And then when the actual hose attaches to this filter housing here, which has a little inline filter, it goes into the manifold inside the device. And there's a um, plunger that moves to just the, the liquid displaces the plunger and it moves along here and allows you to dose based on the calibrated displacement of that plunger. And then another little check valve that you operate when you hit the inject button allows it to go out of the device and into the root zone. So it's a pretty, pretty foolproof, easy to train type of device. In the actual unit itself, there's a few little um, check valve components, to, but it's not that much to maintain. And then the main thing that you're gonna have to worry about for maintenance with this is just making sure you flush water through it because you can get soil and um, product built up in this little injection tip here. But, but that actually is removable. It screws off and you can either replace it or unclog it that way as needed or use like a, a paper clip or something to dislodge dirt from those holes. And just making sure that we're keeping the inline filter clean. Oh, and this is what the actual, so th these components are housed in a little uh, check valve system that looks like that on the side of the unit. So here again is another inside view of the HTI. The main things that go wrong with this unit are um, it, it not injecting is the generic term and that is when it either gets clogged up or there's an issue with the check valves. But you can see there's not a whole lot to maintain in here. This is the manifold, the main guts of the HTI and this is where you'd attach from the filter coming into it that fluid is just filling this empty cylinder here and it's displacing that plunger. And that plunger has a cap on it which um, to prevent fluid leaking out of the manifold and allow it to move. And that cap has some O-rings inside which you'll want to grease periodically with a, like a um, silicone lubricant and you might uh, lubricate this part of the plunger as well. And you can see over time, so if, if this unit is not maintained, you can get little scoring and rust and things built up inside this manifold, which it'll need to be uh, either refurbished or replaced. But that's after many, many seasons of heavy use or people not cleaning their unit properly, typically. Um, and then here again is that inject button uh, check valve. If you're so inclined, it's pretty easy to take apart and just... Um, uncompress the little the little uh, spring that's inside there, make sure that's still got some good spring to it, uh, lubricate that check valve, make sure that there's no O-ring swelling. And it's pretty easy to maintain yourself. You also can certainly send things back into Rainbow for servicing and maintenance. 
Um, if anything does get completely clogged in these lines, it's pretty difficult to clear them. So that's why we recommend after every single use, running clean water through this unit at the end of the day to make sure that nothing builds up in these parts because some of these hose connections are uh, kind of small pinch points. So, like I said, after every use, make sure you're flushing with water. If you clean your tank with a tank cleaning solution, you can run that through the HTI as well if you want. Making sure you're clearing debris from the tip, even if you don't see visible debris, sometimes there's a little bit of dirt or something that can um, really cement in there with that little bit of water that's left over. So it's really good to make sure there's nothing blocking those little holes in the injection tip. And I always recommend remo removing the filter from the filter housing to allow it to dry before putting it back into the HTI because even though you've cleaned it, you've just run water through it and that's a potential for rusting. After heavy use, I recommend uh, removing and cleaning the filter where you're actually scrubbing out the little filter screen and again allowing that to dry completely before putting it back. And to take that off, it's just simple use of using an adjustable or a channel lock wrench and then you can just pull it right out of there. It's pretty easy to do. The um, as needed, you may need to replace the spring or the little ball on the, um, the fill button or the inject button. Those will come, become compressed and worn down over time, depending on how much you use the unit. It might be once a season, it might be once every couple seasons. Um, again, you can send that into Rainbow and they can do it for you, or you can just use a hex wrench on the, this is for the fill button, and then the inject button is attached on the other side of the unit, and it's pretty easy to replace those yourself, and we, you can purchase those replacement parts from us. This is an example of what happens when you don't, when you leave the uh, filter soaking in water, it will rust to the inside of the cap and slow your injection time, so it, it really, we really recommend anytime you have metal parts sitting in water, even if it's even if you've cleaned it out, just letting them dry before you put them back together. Anytime you want to store the HTI for extended use, store it clean um, because, like I said, there's little there's little channels for water in there that it, if there's any uh, chemical residue, it will solidify in there, and that becomes very difficult to clean out. And you can either repair it yourself or send it in for service so it's ready for you when you need it. Send it back to us, for example, when you're done using it in the fall, and you can have it ready to go in the spring. Always empty the water from it completely, and if possible, hang it upright for a few days to allow everything to really dry in there. And um, if, if you have it in unheated storage over the winter, if it's not completely dry, we always get many sent back to us in the spring. They have these chemical leaks, and here you can see there's a crack along the manifold where water freezed inside the unit, and it expanded, and the manifold was cracked. Um, so now we want to talk a little bit about manual and motorized backpack sprayers. So I'm going to start with the manual backpack sprayer because it's low tech, um, although you can use the motorized backpack with the HTI as well. So this backpack sprayer that we stock is called the Chapin Tree and, and Turf Pro. It has a four-gallon tank capacity. Uh, it has a number, it has three-stage filtration, a filter under the cap in the wand and in the tank, and that's actually a removable filter in the tank. They're really nice and easy to get to. There's pressure regulator and gauge on the wand handle and um, adjustable, uh, the pump handle can be moved to either the right or left side. It just is attached to the cotter pin. That way, if you're right or left-handed, you can have it on whichever side you prefer. And the ones that we sell come equipped with a uh, T-Jet 8006 fan tip nozzle, which we found to give really consistent spray coverage for our bark spray applications and our trim tech shrub growth regulator applications. So here's an example of um, one of our virologists using the Chapin backpack for a trim tech spray application on a hedge, and here we have someone doing a bark spray application with backpack on a tree. The, the actual maintenance of these backpacks, there's very little maintenance involved. Um, I've got several that have been used very heavily for three seasons now, and we've done virtually no maintenance on them. Sometimes there's some pump parts that need to be replaced, but they come with a manufacturer um, manual that has very detailed step-by-step -step photo instructions, um, and they sell replacement parts for those pump kits should you need to do that. But as long as you keep them clean, I found them to last pretty pretty long time. Uh, as I said, there's the main 
maintenance concerns that I have is making sure that applicators bring them back with clean filters because anything, again, that's left in those filters, they're designed to, to catch things and that can solidify within those. So here again is a side view of the backpack and you can see there's the filter basket that's removable. Um, there's there's a pump that, and the one that we have is a little bit different, but there's a little like filter screen here on like a, a spoon that you can just kind of grab out and then there's the uh, removable filter in the handle and this is the one that trips people up the most they forget about this one and especially if you're using this for trim tech applications or things with that are a, a thicker material this is a very fine mesh that can gather those particles and bits of dirt and debris and it'll really slow down your your spray. So if you're wondering, if you're pumping and pumping and you're wondering why the spray is so slow, I would this is the first thing I would check. Some people remove this all together. The main advantage, advantage of keeping this on is that if you have a lot of sediment in your water or other things getting into your tank, it prevents um, clogging up your tip. But again, every, all this comes apart, so it's really your preference. Uh, the Mary Wama motorized backpack is the is the motorized backpack that we stock here at Rainbow. And of all the backpacks I've tested, this has definitely got to be one of my favorites. It's got a two cycle engine. It's a clean EPA tier three engine, which means that it's compliant with new emission standards. It has a 25 liter tank or 6.6 .6 gallon tank capacity, which means if you fill it to capacity, it's going to be pretty heavy. This backpack weighs about 20 pounds empty. But it is, I mean, it, we also, they have cart and um, truck mounted options available. And it, it, really, it really is nice to have that larger capacity when you've got to go to a large tree that's far away. It really helps you uh, get the job done. They have a no sweat recoil assist, meaning that it's pretty easy to start these backpacks. Their pressure regulator is unique in that there's four discrete pressure settings. So instead of kind of trying to dial it in and guess what pressure you're at, it has four discrete settings which make it really easy to start your sprays and know what pressure you want to be at. And those range from 90 to 356 PSI. That's their maximum pressure. So it's a, that's enough pressure that you can either attach this to our HTI and easily get your sprays done at one of those, or your injections done at one of those lower settings. Or you can attach it to a spray gun such as this JD9 gun and you can easily spray a, a 12 to 20 foot tree um, for full air spray application. It also has liquid bypass agitation and the ones we stock come with a quick disconnect hose fitting which is compatible with our HTI. Here you can see using the HTI or the um, we can um, stock one for the or we do stock one we can provide one for the J9 gun as well. And that way it's quickly interchangeable to do soil injections or sprays. As far as the maintenance on these backpacks, we found them to be pretty low maintenance and pretty the maintenance is pretty easy to do because of the way they're designed. There's an air filter cover uh, with a simple little wing nut on it that you can take off even if you have gloves on. And that's nice. The air filters, I mean, it's something that they don't tend to clog up too quickly. It, of course, it depends on the environment you're working in, but it is something that for the life of the engine and to make sure that your backpack is operating correctly, you, like any other um, motorized device, you do want to check that periodically and make sure that's clean. Uh, I also really like to stress cycling water through your backpack, not just triple rinsing your tank with the tank drain, but cycling water through the pump every time you're done. Uh, using this backpack, which of course you're going to do anyway, because if you're using the HTI with it, you want to make sure you can cycle some clean water through the HTI. But it's just to help prevent any sediment from building up in the pump and clogging up those parts. And if you're going to if you're going to store this for any extended period of time, it's always a good idea to purge the gasoline or run it dry for extended storage because that can be corrosive. Now this is a two-cycle engine, so there's no oil changes. It's a 50 to 1 ratio, similar to what you'd use for a chainsaw or other. Uh, small like lawn maintenance equipment, tree care equipment. Um, so now I'm going to move into macro injection systems. So there are two types of tree injection systems broadly out there. There's macro injection and by that it's we mean very high volume so typically much greater than one liter and for what we do with um, fungicide injections on elms and it's, it's usually on the realm of like 30 gallons per tree. And then these also tend to be, they don't have to be, but they tend to be lower pressure. So you'll hear macro injection used synonymously with 
uh, macro infusion. Infusion was the term used when these were, uh, you're going at basically 10 PSI and allowing the tree to just take up the product, um, much of its own accord. Micro injection, uh, conversely, are lower volume applications, typically less than one liter. And they're typically much higher pressure with systems ranging from 15 to 250 PSI delivery. Just a quick illustration of why we still use macro injection. So you see all those big barrels and tubing and you think, why would anyone even use that at all now that we have micro injection? And the answer for that is pest biology. For some problems, and in this case it would be um, particularly Dutch elm disease is, is more where we really use macro injection a lot on our commercial services. You, these fungicides do not move laterally well enough in wood tissue to get good enough coverage in small volumes, and you're using fewer injection sites with small volumes, so you have, you just have a much more difficult time to getting very, very diffuse, even coverage into all these tiny little branch unions where these um, beetles are going to be feeding. And Insecticides as well versus fungicides. Insecticides, you're trying to knock down an insect population and they're moving around, they're feeding on multiple plant parts. A fungicide, you're trying to prevent any introduction of that fungi, fungi at all and keep it static where it's introduced. So you need to get almost 100% coverage. So we've really found through our testing that macro injection for these fungicide applications is still the way to go. And that's how Rainbow got its start. And here's a little video that kind of shows you macro infusion if you've never seen it before or done it. With all of our injections, we recommend injecting into the root flares because you're going to get optimal uptake and distribution, but it's particularly important with macro infusion because you're doing such high volumes. And you can see here that we've got tubing and teas going into the root flares. An uptake averages one hour for these. That was a 50-inch elm tree that ended up being a little under an hour, but it can also take many hours as well because it is quite a lot of solution. So here we have two types of macro injection systems that we offer at Rainbow. This is our standard high volume macro infusion system. It has an electric pump and we have one in both a um, 112 volt and a, I believe it's a 9 volt. There's a, one, one 15 and 12 volt. Okay. Peter says 115 and, and 12 volt. I'll have to double check that. But <laughs> anyway, we have one that's compatible with a generator or a power outlet and one that is compatible with a marine battery. Um, and you can see here on the pump that it's pretty simple. There's a little filter here for the intake. There's the pump itself. There's a pressure regulator. There's a pressure gauge. And then it's the output to the tubing. There's a tubing harness with injection T's, and the tubing harness on both systems is identical. The only difference is the reservoir and the actual pump itself. The high volume system, the reservoir is typically going to be a barrel or a trash can or some other large volume receptacle. The low volume system is a canister with a manual pump attached all in one system. This system here, the low volume system, is typically what we use for oak wilt treatments and um, prescription um, micronutrient treatments such as our iron treatments, our verdure and our verdure um, MN. These treatments uh, just have a lower solution volume and have a little bit better distribution. So it, this type of system is okay for that. And this handle is just a simple pump. It's just a column with the little check valve in the bottom that allows you to pump air in with each pump and it prevents solution from going back up. There's just a little check valve with an O-ring. You just have to add a little bit of silicone lubricant to that and to this uh, pressure relief valve as well. And that's all the maintenance that this thing requires other than occasionally rinsing it out with water. Same thing with this pump. There's not a whole lot of maintenance involved here. The number one thing that we run into is people just not cleaning this filter. So remove this filter housing and keep that filter clean. Sometimes they can actually clog up very, very quickly. And, um, th and just making sure you're storing this clean and dry, particularly if you're using a solution where you add muriatic acid or another pH um, regulator into your solution to lower the pH if you're using an alkaline water source. 
you want to make sure that you're keeping this away just to prevent corrosion and rust building up on this device. For micro-injection systems, we offer a suite of equipment that we refer to as our IQ suite. We have a manual gun, a pressurized harness system, and a battery pump high pressure system. We call our manual gun the Q gun, and I'm going to start there. But first I wanted to talk a little bit about plugless injection and, and kind of how we developed our equipment suite and why we do things a little bit differently. So all of our injection equipment, including our macro systems, are plugless, meaning you're not injecting, when you drill the hole, you're introducing that T directly into the hole. There's no other type of plug or cap introduced into that wood tissue. All of our equipment also uses a 1564 inch hole, so no plugs at all. Now, the, the merit of plugs has been debated, and I'm not here to debate the merit of plugs. Um, this is a tree that we actually, it's the same tree, we injected two sides of it with plugs and without, and you can see after one year, they're both closing, and, and in a healthy, vigorous ash, ash tree, wounds will close. But Rainbow really started to, to notice and, and to hear that, um, we've noticed this in our own experience and heard this as well, that there tends to be more cambial damage and bark splitting and separation associated with the use of plugs. So we started to develop a system without plugs, ha having concern for the, the instances when this happens. It certainly is not every tree, but in the cases where you do see damage associated with plugs, we have not seen the same damage associated with plugless systems. So we've really moved completely away from plugs when we developed our tree care systems. And so again, our injection tees reduce tree wounding by eliminating potential bark separation or pressure injury from having the plug set into the wood. We improve wound compartmentalization um, just because we have less material removed. So our injection tees are smaller than the plugs on the market. So you're wounding the tree less for each drill site. You're not leaving plastic behind, which some people consider to be um, just a better perception for um, their treatment practices. And we have a long history of injection without plugs. Um, so it's, it, this is, it uses an APHIS tip, so it, it's been in use before we developed this system. So tree injection without plugs, um, is, is product going to come shooting back out or is it going to leak during injection? And when injections are done properly, no, that won't happen. The, and the reason is that the T itself, the tip is actually tapered. You can see here, there's a little bit of machining here where this tip is actually narrower here than it is here. So this is the tree bark would be about here. You've got the cork tissue and the cambium. All that is sealing against this part of the tip, that flexible tissue. And then you've got a reservoir created here, slightly around the side of the tip and then in front where you still have exposure between the product and the active xylem. So you create a good seal and you still get um, good uptake. So going back to the Q gun, the Q gun features a floating tip attachment, although we also have a static option available where you just got a tip coming straight out of the end of the gun. Um, there's no measuring product and it has an ergonomic handle where you're squeezing the handle to inject the dose. This system is great for small volume dosing the chamber, um, while it's it goes up to 10 mils, you can easily inject um, one to five mils per inch product. So it, it's easier to dose than some of our other pro our other other equipment, which tends to work a little bit better for higher volume. This is much easier to deliver a very small dose. It works great for small trees. It works great for small sites, and it's got a flexible range of uses. You can run a lot of different products through it. The reason that um, it's handy to have around in your toolbox, as I'd say, is because sometimes you just want to um, inject, you, you might do a large commercial operation with a different device and you might use this for a couple of trees that you have to inject with something else. So it gives you that versatility option. Here again is the illustration of the floating tip and the static tip, just to show you the difference between the two. 
The reason that we originally developed the floating tip is so it was a little bit more ergonomically friendly to the applicator. You can set your injection T and then you can get up and move around while still holding onto the gun. You don't have to be right down at the tree with the injection T. That said, there is a um, there is a dosing lock here on the end of the gun. So you could, if uptake is slow, instead of holding the handle there, you can lock it and set it down and get up and check your emails or do something else if you need to. And here again is an illustration of setting that, that dosing lock. So as I said, one of the features of the Q gun is that it is um, self-contained dosing. So there's less risk of exposure to, to the applicator when you're using pesticides. So all you have to do is set the dose on the Q gun, fill up the bottle with the product that you want to use, and then you just prime it from the bottle to the gun in a cycle. Through There's a little port on the top of the, the bottle, and then when you're done, you just break that seal and purge it back into the bottle, and you're not pouring and, and dosing at each tree. You can adjust the dose in the cylinder without having to purge the device each time. All you have to do is um, push in the plunger and set your dosing lock screw. So some of the benefits of the Q gun, it's highly portable, it's affordable, and it's really great for low volume dosing and, and versatility. But some of the drawbacks as well is that it's manually powered, so you're squeezing to provide the pressure to deliver the dose, and for some species and some product volumes that becomes impractical. And you do have to inject each injection site one at a time, so it can be more, uh, or it can be less efficient for some types of projects and sites. However, it's very low tech and easy to maintain, so if you're just getting started with PHC, it has the benefit of being very easy to train on and very easy to upkeep. This is, these are all of the components. This is the Q gun completely disassembled. The only main things that you have to worry about, there's a check valve here and a check valve here. There, it's just a simple core operated check valve where fluid pushes it in one direction and it prevents backflow by pushing it in the other direction. You wanna make sure those springs face in the direction of flow. And that's about all you've gotta know. The other things that you want to maintain on this periodically, it helps to, um, there's three O-rings in the device. There's one in the plunger, there's one in the front of the cylinder, and that just helps keep it watertight. And there's a little O-ring in the front as well. It helps to extend the life of O-rings if you keep them lubricated with like a silicone lubricant. It's not 100% necessary for the operation of this device, but it really does help extend the life of those parts because not only does it keep it watertight, it also keeps product and, and chemical um, out of contact with those materials. So all you have to do for the basic maintenance of this gun is clean it, clean the injection tip and the bottle after you're done using it, let it dry before extended storage, and soak all parts um, disassembled as shown here if you start to have a buildup of chemical residue and keep these little silicone o-rings in the barrel and then these little black ones here lubricated periodically. Um, yeah, I think that's all I'm going to say about this guy. It's, he's pretty easy to use. When I say cleaning, I'm talking about a cleaning solution that contains um, typically a small amount of isopropyl alcohol or our standard cleaning solution for heavy residues is one part isopropyl alcohol and two parts water, and that's if you're using a 70% rubbing alcohol solution like you can get at Walgreens or the drugstore, Walmart, Uline. Um, if you're using a more concentrated lab-grade isopropyl alcohol, I would dilute it even further, one part isopropyl alcohol to three parts water. And the reason is more is not always better. While it's a good solvent to kind of get those chemical residues out of your equipment, it also can dry out some of your O-rings and remove those lubricants, and that will eventually degrade their life. So you just want to make sure if you're doing heavy cleaning that you're also following it up with either rinsing it through with water again or re-lubricating um, those O-rings. Oh, and another note on that, only use isopropyl alcohol. We've had problems with other types of methylated alcohols and other types of um, alcohols you can buy in stores, just keep it to isopropyl alcohol. I'm not going to go too detailed into troubleshooting. Our Q-Gun comes with a manual with a troubleshooting table, and it has detailed step-by-step -step 
pictures and instructions to do each of those um, recommended repairs. So you want to say anything else on that? Yeah, so it's there's not a whole lot of troubleshooting that goes along with the Q-gun. The main problem that we have is with check valves being inserted incorrectly. So again, just to make sure that you're following that and, and keeping the plunger lubricated. So now I want to move into the Q-Connect, which is our harness system. This system has a floating tip harness. It's, all, it's still plugless, same, same injection tees. These injection tees, however, have these easy on and off valves. They have the bottle has a universal Schrader valve for use with any bike pump. So you just attach a bike pump to the top of this bottle to pressurize it when you're ready to perform the injection. It's great for large sites and commercial properties. We call this our universal workhorse because one applicator can set up this device in a couple of minutes. If they're really experienced, probably less than three minutes for, for a pretty good size ash tree. And then these injection tees, you've set up the entire application for the tree, you've got the entire product dose you've measured into this bottle, you pressurize it and you can move on to your next tree with another unit and leapfrog between them. So you've got one injection that's being performed completely while you move on to the next one. It's, so it becomes economical and efficient for large production jobs. Here again is a close-up of that injection tee. We've got that easy on-off valve. You just turn it 90 degrees to turn it off or open it parallel to turn it on. This is just an aluminum handle, this nice ergonomic grip, and a stainless steel injection tip. These are all push to connect fittings on here as well, which I'll get into a little bit later. This again is a, is a device that you dose per tree. And then you just drill your injection site, set up your harness, pressurize it, and you're good to go. The maintenance that goes along with this device, again, it's not too complicated, but it has got a little bit more parts to keep up with. The daily use is pretty simple. All you have to do is clean it out. Um, our commercial services just flush it with water on a day-to-day -day basis when it's in heavy use, and then clean it with an alcohol solution after a few days of use, or at the end of the week. But you do want to make sure you're checking those tips for clogs um, so that you don't have anything that would solidify in the end of this device. Weekly, I recommend soaking all the different harness components. So I would take apart these different harness components and soak them in an isopropyl alcohol solution, a dilute solution, just to help kind of remove any of that residue. These, um, what I didn't say is this harness all of these parts are identical and interchangeable. So you can adapt this to any size tree to meet your needs. And also they're easy to take apart and put back together. After heavy use, you want to check your tubing ends. Because you are taking these on and off, the way these push to connect work, um, you can kink or, or score this tubing. So you just want to make sure that those tubing ends stay clean and, and neat. And then uh, I do occasionally separate everything and soak them, um, and I will treat that then as, as pesticide waste um, or rinse aid if I've got cleaning solution in it. And you want to allow that to dry completely before you reassemble it. These are some of the tools I like to have on hand for field repair and maintenance of my Q-Connect. I always like to have a small adjustable wrench for um, tightening my injection tips if I need to, um, a flathead screwdriver a, that is to loosen the set screw on the injection tip small wire brush or pick, and uh, I don't usually repair tubing in the field, um, but you might want to have some thread lock and, and a knife around to be able to repair that tubing. If you don't want to keep track of all those parts, we have a nice little field repair kit that comes with a Schrader valve core replacement and, and replacer tool and some extra tubing and some little wire picks and a adjustable wrench, and it comes with a neat, handy uh, picture guide for making field repairs. So this is pretty much anything you could to address anything you could encounter in the field and just get you up and running to finish applications for that day. So we do have a, a field maintenance kit available. So I wanted to get back to a little bit and focus on the tubing. Because all of our devices use this, this thin nylon tubing, it's really important with these push to connects that you have a nice clean flush edge. So I recommend using a razor, a box cutter, or a, a sharp knife to chew up those ends once in a while. 
scissors or shears tend to kind of compress the tubing and you can get leaking around the sides of them. You might not get a good um, meeting with the push to connect and, and dull knives can rip and tear and, and create, um, again, problematic ends which don't allow the push to connect to seat nicely with the tubing. Um, that, okay, I do have a slide here. So again, uh, we do have the, in the manual a nice troubleshooting table with the possible problems that are free and step by step with new clients use device are how to use push to connects properly. So all these little connection pieces have what are called push to connect fittings. So there's a little plastic collet that you push down on and there's little teeth inside of this opening. And so when you push down on it, it retracts those teeth and then what you can insert the tubing, and then when you release that button, you'll feel it seat snugly in there, and you kind of push the tubing down a little bit more, and the teeth will grab it and prevent the tubing from being pulled back out. Well, and that's where I said that you can, with, with heavy use of these devices, those teeth can kind of score that tubing, so you do want to, I would say at least once a season or before your next season in the winter, you really want to check the ends of all those tubings and make sure anything hasn't been scored too deeply, because that could leak. If you have a pressure leak somewhere in your system and you can't tell where it's coming from, it's just not holding pressure or you hear a hissing sound but you can't localize it, the easiest way to deal with a harness system like this is just to get yourself a five gallon bucket of water, pressurize the system and close all the valves on it, you submerge the system in the water and you'll see tiny air bubbles coming up from wherever that leak is occurring. And this has saved me so many times. You don't know if did I not push tubing in fully in one of these many little sites or, you know, is it something where I didn't screw the bottle cap on tightly enough? So it's a really easy, fast and easy way to identify the source of a leak and address the problem. So that's a little tip I like to tell people. Um, the IQ infuser now is our self-contained battery operated high pressure device. This device, like I said, it's a, it's a battery operated pump, an actuator, it's a smart pressure system, meaning there's a pressure sensor in this device, so not only does it tell you when pressure is dropped and your injection is done, it also ramps up pressure only to the amount it needs to complete the injection. So if you set this device to 200 PSI, it's not going to come out in one fast rush. It'll slowly ramp up the pressure to the amount the tree will accept, and then it'll back off a bit and then ramp it back up. So you'll hear it kind of making all these crazy noises as it's doing the injection, and that's the actuator and the pump. Um, working to deliver that injection dose. It's a one-click trigger operation, so there's a little trigger lock on the side of the gun. You pull the trigger and then it does the injection for you. There's no holding down the trigger. You just let it do its thing. And it, it has a static or a floating tip option as well. And it's great for if you want to do higher pressure applications, if you want to come to a site with a really professional appearance or if you have pesticide exposure concerns with your applicators or the community that you're working in, this is a very nice, easy, self-contained device. You can fill up this product reservoir before you even leave the shop and then you're programming the dose on this top plate here and, and the device is doing everything. There's no more exposure for the rest of the day. You purge directly back into this bottle without even disconnecting any lines. It's all set up and ready to go. Here's the picture of the floating tip option. We just switch out a little connection piece in that gun and then it just, um, this makes it really easy to maneuver in tight spaces or under trees with low canopies or whatever it might be. And we've got this programmable display here. And the nice thing about the floating tip option is that you can use that floating tip and then you still see the pressure sensor on the gun. So you can have the gun removed from it's not immediately at the base of the tree where the tip is, and you can monitor that pressure sensor light a, a little bit of a distance away from the base of the tree. So for IQ maintenance, after every use, you really want to make sure you purge out the product that's in the device. There are very sensitive uh, check valves and little things inside here that'll gum up if um, you do leave products sitting in that device. And we that's our that's our number one issue. I would probably say. Um, with new clients is uh, um, having application issues with their device. Uh, and you and I would recommend running a cleaning solution through the unit for several cycles. Um, 
one of our because everything is is enclosed in this unit and it's it's more difficult to get it to dry out completely one of our um, employees here really advocates for chasing the cleaning solution with water just so you don't have alcohol in contact with um, some of the seals inside the unit um, to just help extend the life of those a little bit longer and then you want to purge any of that cleaning solution as well and run the unit on air for a little bit just to cycle all the, all the moisture out of it as best you can and make sure you're not leaving any dirt or chemical residue on the top panel or if anything was spilled on it and make sure the gun tip is clear of clogs. The only real different thing you're going to do for after heavy use or before extended storage is to clean the inline filter and filter screen that's on the bottle dip tube. So the reservoir bottle here, there's a dip tube inside of this and attached to that there's a little inline filter. You don't have to remove it from the tube. All you have to do is screw apart the two halves and kind of get out that little filter screen inside there and make sure there's nothing obstructing it and replace the filter screen. And then um, just make sure it, you can also disconnect some of this bottle tubing and help it dry a little bit better before extended storage. And make sure you're not storing it with the battery in the unit. The unit will draw a little bit of power from the battery and run it down over time, so we recommend just storing those separately in a clean, dry place. The troubleshooting for the IQ is pretty straightforward in that it's got a little computer microchip brain, so it's very similar to troubleshooting your computer, mostly. <laughs> Step one, turn it off and turn it back on. <laughs> when in doubt, that's uh, what uh, you know the, the, the tech support stand by. And if it doesn't reset, you can remove and reinsert the battery. It does have a short memory, so you want to you wanna turn it off for a few seconds before turning it back on. Otherwise, it doesn't tend to reset. The other big thing is you want to check your fluid and air intake setting. So on the top of this top plate here, up in the upper right-hand corner, there's a little knob, and it says F and A. F is for fluid, A is for air. If you can't prime the lines, you can't inject, it doesn't seem to be pressurizing, you're probably in air mode, and then you just switch it to fluid. And you want to check your operation mode. I've done this myself where I'm trying to inject and it's not injecting and I realize I'm in priming and cleaning mode. So you just want to make sure you're in the mode that you intend to be to operate the unit. And sometimes, and especially in some of the earlier models we had, some of the programming would get confused with priming in um, increments of less than 50. So the, the actuator that we have moves in 50 milliliter increments to come all the way out and back home. So we recommend priming it in increments of 50 especially um, 150 mils because that'll pretty much get all the air out of it in one cycle and it just helps kind of make sure that actuator finds its way home. Um, in the prime and clean mode you're holding down the trigger to operate it the entire time versus in inject mode you just push the trigger once and it moves the program distance, so it, it sometimes gets a little bit confused in prime and clean mode if people are kind of uh, trigger happy, so it just helps to prime in increments of 50 mils. And again, if you have additional questions, you can always call our technical support. The other big question that we get is um, the pressure light not turning off when you're doing an injection. And the most likely culprits for that are um, back pressure from the tree or obstruction in the, in the gun itself or in the lines or in the unit. So it's reading pressure somewhere where there's no pressure. Um, with the back pressure from the tree, you are introducing an incompressible liquid into a water column in the tree. So sometimes you just have slow uptake and water's not moving and you can't put anything else into the tree and it, that pressure is going to stay high. And so in those instances, you don't necessarily want to take this gun out quickly because you could have a little bit of product come back at you. So what you want to do is um, if the pressure reading is holding steady or dropping very, very slowly, you can slowly twist the gun a little bit and back it out. And if you get any seepage around the sides, I would just put it back in and wait. Other times, this, this pressure sensor can be a little bit tricky. It, it is programmed to turn off under 5 PSI, which is pretty low. Sometimes just injecting in a tree, it'll stay at about 7 or 10 PSI. So if it's staying, it plateaus at that pressure for a long period of time, you can remove the gun and move to the next injection site. An advantage of, of this unit, 
similar to the HTI, it keeps track for you. You program in your injection dose, and it won't let you over or underdose the tree. It counts down for you at each site, and the pressure light goes off when the injection's done. You move to the next site, it counts down for you again, and once it reaches zero, all you have to do is hit reset to move on to the next tree, and you can adjust your dose if needed. So, what is your decision for all of these tools that are available to you? How do you decide which one you'd want to use? Well, again, it comes down to your targeted pest and pressure. So soil applications can be fast and economical treatment, for example, of emerald ash borer. But really, there's numerous studies have shown that emomectin benzoate injections are really more effective for controlling emerald ash borer under high pressure situations. And you also get the benefit of multiple year control with that type of um, treatment. Also, and that would be through tree injection. And also uh, your fungicide treatments and your vascular wilt, the only control for that is a tree injected systemic fungicide. So it depends on the product you want to use as well. It depends on your retreatment window and service structure. Maybe you want to be on a site every year, and so annual services fit into your structure. But maybe you're doing a lot of commercial sites where it benefits you to be able to stagger those applications. So a multi-year product residual and, and something like a tree injection product would make more sense for you than an annual soil injection. Your tree species and size will also dictate what type of equipment is best for you. The site itself, whether it's the number of trees you have to deal with, the species or special considerations like a high water table or a county restriction on sprays or something like that. The number of applicators that you want to use if you want to hire, if you want to get a lot done with fewer people, something like a Q connector that allows you to kind of set it and move on to the next tree would probably be more efficient for you than something where you have to monitor each injection site. And the ease of applicator training. All of these different devices have um, benefits and drawbacks to applicator training, ease of use, and maintenance. So it's, it's again, that's going to be to your discretion and what fits into your business and, and how you want to structure what your people are doing with their time. So at this point, I'll open it up to questions, and I think Peter's going to moderate those. <clears throat> All right. Thanks, Emily. Thanks, Emily. Um, so if you so do you have any questions, uh, please uh, make sure to type those into the questions, questions in the chat, chat box, box. and uh, uh, we'll uh, try to answer as many as we can with the uh, minutes we have left here. Uh, just a quick reminder, uh, please make sure to enter in your ISA certification number. Uh, into, uh, into the, the uh, uh, questions uh, and chat box, box. Uh, and uh, we'll make sure that you uh, see you uh, for attending. So I see one question here right away that's a great question to address. So David Green asks, how do you overcome very thick bark for proper placement? i gotta got to have the microphone with me, I suppose. Well. <laughs> so how do you overcome very thick bark for proper placement of the chemical when the taper of the Q gun and IQ is limiting the depth? Yeah, so I'm going to go back here to a previous slide, Let's see if I can illustrate it well. So we do, we do tons of ash injections, we do tons of elm injections, and those both have pretty thick bark. You might have, you know, an inch or so of cork tissue. And so what you're doing is you're just altering your drill depth. So you drill a little bit deeper with those species, and it's still, your, your cork tissue is pretty flexible, so you'll see that these T's tend to be a little bit more submerged. You're, it helps to go between into the froze, but that's not always necessary. Um, and then you're just, it's just seeding here as opposed to, um, I don't know if I have another illustration, as opposed to a little bit farther out, like here you see this thin bark species. And the other thing that you want to make sure you're doing is we always advocate injecting down on the root flares as opposed to higher up on the tree where you're going to have thicker bark ridges. So there tends to be a little bit um, shallower bark ridges on the actual root flare themselves. So that helps as well. Um, so here you can see the, the furrows on this ash are a little bit less severe here. But it's, um, let's see if I have another good elm picture. I don't. But, but yeah, definitely. Um, it's not it's not been an issue with thicker bark.
I see a question here. Why in root collar? I think that means um, why are we doing these injections down in the root flares and down on the root collar of these trees? So that is because, um, darn it, and I actually removed that slide, but the, you, the vascular bundles are actually closer together and there's more vascular tissue to inject um, with active xylem down on these root flares. So you get a much, much um, faster uh, uptake, uptake speed um, for injecting lower down on the tree. And I've witnessed this myself. Sometimes if you go a little bit too high up because the soil, you know, these trees are planted too deep, um, really that slows down the injection. So just by excavating a little bit around for those trees that are planted too deep and getting farther down on that root collar, you really increase your uptake speed and your distribution as well because you're going to have contact with more active vascular tissue. Okay, so I see a question here that says, when drilling trees, what is the difference if drill sizes for plug injections and, oh, okay, um, if, what is the difference, I think it's supposed to say, what is the difference in drill sizes for plug injections and plugless injection systems? Uh, is there a significant difference in hole sizes? Yes, so um, our drill bit size is a 15 64 inch, so it's like a quarter of an inch um, diameter, whereas uh, like a number four arbor plug is a 3 8 inch hole, so it's much, much larger, and these pictures aren't to scale, and this has already started to heal over, but you'd see that you know, it'd be about this large in, in circumference as opposed to about that. So it's it's a much smaller injection site. Um, let's see, any other questions here? So, okay, here's someone who says, application timing is best or fastest in the morning. Should you not attempt in the afternoon? Okay, yeah, so we, I have heard anecdotally that a lot of um, applicators say that application time is best in the morning when these trees are starting to transpire and it's, um, you have good soil moisture, it's a really good time to perform injections efficiently. I have personally experienced all different iterations on that. I've had times where, where uptake picks up in the afternoon. I've had times where it's slow in the morning and, and faster in the afternoon, times where it's faster in the morning and slower in the afternoon. The conventional wisdom is that it is faster in the morning, and I'm sure there is some um, instances to support that, but I, we, we perform injections all day long, and I wouldn't see any reason why that would um, hinder your operations, averaged out. Okay, so here's a question from Dennis Clark. Which method is best for triage injections? So triage is an amomectin benzoate product, for those of you who don't know, for the treatment of emerald ash borer. And that can be used with any of these micro-injection systems. But I think if you're going to do a lot of ash injections, the Q-Connect is what our commercial services use because it's really it's it's a really efficient workhorse for that type of injection. You're going on the order of four to ten mils per inch, depending on your protocol, and so that's a fairly high um, injection volume. You're usually dosing between 70 and, and 200 mils per tree um, for lot. Well, at least for the average ash tree sizes we have around here, and then. Um, you, you just set up your harness for that tree. If it's a different size tree, you just pop off one of these ports and reconnect it to adjust your size. And then your applicator sets that one up and goes to the next tree. And we've done hundreds of trees in an afternoon with a fairly small crew with this type of setup. And each of them have two units of their, their leapfrogging from trees to trees on these large municipal or commercial sites. Even residential sites, this is a great tool to just quickly set up, let the tree do its injection they can be filling out their work order or doing anything else they need to do, and then they just take it down. I would say, I mean, it, there are other Mvectin Benzoate products on the market too, um, and I haven't personally tried the new G4 product, but uptake can vary with the different formulations, but um, these Mvectin Benzoate injections in general, I would say usually less than 20 minutes per tree. Our Q-Connect plugless, yes, all of our injection systems are plugless. So, okay, we've got a question. How large of a tree can you treat with the Q-Connect and how many T's can be attached? Um, 
So the, the out of the box, the QConnect comes with a harness of 10 T's. And our, app, our um, application protocol is one T per two inches of diameter. So for a 20 inch tree, you need 10 injection T's. So this out of the box will treat a 20 inch tree, up to a 20 inch tree. Um, you can connect as many of these as, in series as you would like. Um, I've done 60 inch trees with the QConnect. So it's just, um, if you have another unit, you can attach it together. Otherwise, we have, um, we have available extra ports um, or harnesses that you can order a la carte as well. All right. Well, we are at the end of our scheduled time here. So I uh, just wanted to thank uh, Emily for her presentation and thank you all for uh, joining us today. Uh, we do have a uh, post uh, survey that follows uh, once you uh, log off the uh, go to webinar. If you could fill that out, that would be uh, much appreciated. We're always looking at ways to improve uh, what we do here at Rainbow. So thanks again for joining us and uh, have a great uh, rest of your day.